And today I am so excited to welcome to the show Mr. Harry Duran, who is the founder of Fullcast, a full service done for you podcast production and marketing consultancy. He helps brands and high performing entrepreneurs amplify their authority and extend their reach through the power of podcasting. I have been lucky enough to be acquainted with or friends with Harry now for a couple of years. I think we originally met at Podfest, it was, but then, or did you and I run in? into each other at that um, Silver Lake Mixer first. Yes. I can't remember which yes, one it was. Yes, it's a business, business mixer in Silver Lake. Yeah. yeah, which is also the power of going to local mixers, which will be a topic of a future show. But thank you so much for being on the show, Harry. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, welcome well, to the Tradigital Podcast. Thanks so much, Stephanie, for inviting me. And I'm grateful uh, for this time to share my story with your audience. Awesome. So yeah, like I mentioned, uh, Harry is not only a podcaster, but he has really built his business through podcasting and social media as well. And he's done it in a really intentional and kind of, I say, just super genuine way, which I really love. Um, you know, I actually just had on our show, Heather Hyman, who is also in social media marketing. And I said, what I loved about her was that she's not one of those people that is out in the social media space, screaming the big kind of glitzy, look at me, look at me. I'm the, I'm the guru. I'm the best, you know, those kind of screamy people. And I find that Harry, you're the same way. You're very, you know, kind of just kind of this mellow, approachable person doing things in a very genuine way. And I was like, you know, this is somebody that resonates with me because for his as lively as I am when you meet me in person, you know, really, that's kind of my vibe. I am much more laid back and intentional and thoughtful than I think sometimes people even know about me. But uh, yeah, so I love what you have been able to do through using podcasting and social media to really get the word out about Fullcast and what you do. So can you tell me a little bit about what that journey was? You know, was the podcasting kind of the launching point for your business or where did that start? Yeah, I think the the quick story is that I was in uh, corporate America for about 20 plus years. And I like to say that I was like listening to other people's voices. And so like the first one was like my, my father, like he wanted me to go to college. And he's like, oh, this is like, he would play these tapes, like these um, Think and Grow Rich, like Napoleon Hill, mm. like vinyl too. And, and cause I think it was cassettes at the time. <laughs> and so I, I probably wish I had paid more attention back then. Um, and then, but that never happened because I got a full time job at a, at, a, at a bank and I thought I had made it. I was wearing a suit and tie and I was like, oh, this is it. I'm, I'm going to be successful. Um, and then eventually I made it to corporate life. I got a, um, a really well paying job, but it, there was always like this seed of like some, some other opportunities. Thankfully, I had a, a really good boss that I called my corporate godfather. He kept like pr you know, promoting me. Mm -hmm. And his was like the second voice. At one point, he's like, you know, that six figure salary means you're like in the top 10% of all income earners. And I was like, oh, this is it. Like I, I had made it. But there was always like this entrepreneurial seed planted in me. And then when the dot com craze came in 1999, I left for like the you know, the first time I left that I was convinced that this is my shot at dot com millions. <laughs> I cashed out my 401k to zero. Wow. And I was like, uh, needless to say, we'd probably be in a different place if that had worked out. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> and so I ended up back in corporate uh, America. And I was, I thankfully had connections and I got started to work on that again. But um, the next opportunity came when I, I had uh, an opportunity to connect with my um older um, my half brother he lived in atlanta at the time and so I, I went i went there i did that for a little while and i, I actually went to construction of all things like mm. like so i was in it i was doing digital like e-business type stuff and i went to go i was literally like sca climbing a scaffold wearing a hard hat <laughs> <laughs> i did that for like two years I, was, I learned how to read blueprints which was pretty awesome um but you know what they say about working with family like i ended up back at home like uh i think it was 2000 and four, I took a flight back to New York, like with my tail between my legs, because I was forced to go live with my parents. Wow. At, like, yeah, at 34, it was crazy. Um, but the, you know, I got, I got back in, in the corporate life. I was working for that again. And then I, I was always, always been a fan of music, uh, electronic music, DJing. I grew up like DJing turntables and vinyl and all that sort of stuff. So I created a mobile app called Know Your DJ. And I thought I was wanted to interview DJs. So I went to a podcasting conference. It's called New Media. It was actually a new media expo. It was actually new media. It was uh, YouTube, podcasting, and blogging. Mm -hmm. And so it was there that I had the idea that I was going to start a podcast to promote the app. And then um, I started talking to all these podcasts, seeing all these podcasters, like Pat Flynn was there, Amy Porterfield. And uh, I said, maybe I should 
change gears and I'm so fascinated. I, I remember this show called Inside the Actor Studio where yes. they would interview actors and I was mm-hmm. like, what if I did that for podcasters? Mm-hmm. So that's where Podcast Junkies was born. And I just started a natural curiosity, face-to-face conversations like we're having now because it's so powerful. I think one of the hidden secrets of podcasting is the ability to network and, and make connections with people mm-hmm. um, that you can establish long-time relationships with. And so that's what I did. And I have this mantra of treating every guest like gold. And so it's been 200 plus episodes since uh, 2014, still going strong, a weekly show. Um, it's been a fascinating way to build my um, connection in the podcasting community. So that's mm-hmm. one of the important takeaways, like w- wherever community you're trying to establish growth in, you know, make yourself known within and and be genuine in trying to like uh, establish connections and friendships with people in that community. In, in my case, it's meta. It's a podcast about podcasting. <laughs> so, I, so I go to podcasting conferences. Um, and then what happened at the time is I didn't really have a lot of digital marketing, entrepreneurial, like skills. So I hired a business coach. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a, a famous uh, inspirational speaker by the name of Jim Rohn, who says you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And, and that sort of hit home for me because I was like, I don't really have a lot of entrepreneurial friends. And so, you know, I paid a pretty decent amount of money every month to a coach and I learned quickly on, um, um, well, quickly <laughs> on what I didn't know. Um, as an entrepreneur, you need to be, be comfortable failing uh, and right. getting back up. Because I think we think like we're going to, if the first one, we don't hit it out of the park, then, uh, then we're a failure. But I think what I learned along the way is like, you just, le- just have to learn how to fail fast and mm-hmm. just dust yourself off and get back up, try the next thing. And so over time, I realized um, I knew a lot about podcasting. I was learning a lot about digital marketing. So I built Fullcast, which is uh, short for full service podcasting. Mm-hmm. And it's a full service done for you agency. And uh, I've been doing that for almost uh, four years now and been, you know, been grateful to work with some high-powered entrepreneurs, some brands, uh, K-Swiss, the sneaker company. We're working with a former Olympian from the 2008 gymnastics team. Just mm-hmm. really cool people doing great things and, and looking to establish their voice and present themselves as a thought leader through podcasting. So that's the that's the journey <laughs> that got me wow. to here. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's kind of funny because I was, I was along with you for most of that journey too. I were similar ages and I went through the up and downs of the dot-com bubble too and, and figuring out, um, have I made it? No, I didn't make it. Am I starting over? But you know, one of the things, you know, like you said, is like, not only do you have to be comfortable failing, but you have to be really comfortable trying new things, you know, just giving something a shot and not getting stuck. And I think that's one of the things that I've seen you do so well on social media is really trying the different platforms as they come out and being willing to, you know, try, you know, see what, what they can do to build your audience or to reach out to people or to have those conversations and all. And I know that is part of what you do at Fullcast too, right? You provide the social media assets for, yeah, for the podcasters, because that is important too. It's like, great that you are a podcaster, but then how do you also make sure that you are spreading the word that your podcast is available? So uh, within the social media space, can you give us like maybe your top two tips of what you think people should be doing on social media and what they shouldn't be doing on social media insofar as like building your business? Well, I'll start with the should not. I think one of the, um, you should not try to immediately, if you're just getting started and, and for me, I have content to produce, um, to share on social media, which is the podcast episodes in the beginning, it was me wanting to share the episodes that come out and just, um, letting people know that that was available. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you try to be depending on how much time you have, but you you can't be everywhere at all times. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people just repurpose content. So they just turn on all those switches in Facebook or Twitter or vice versa, whatever it is that allows you to automatically post from Facebook to Twitter or from Twitter to Facebook. And the problem with that is you're not, um, showing people that you understand that specific platform. And so you can see like shared from Twitter, shared from Facebook, and the images get cut off because, you know, Twitter shows images different than LinkedIn, than, than Facebook. And a lot of times you can easily tell when someone has just basically clicked all the buttons. Mm-hmm. Some of the hosting companies, they make it easy to share too. But you don't really get the sense that it's, uh, that that's you posting directly. It's just you clicking all the, the, the repurpose icons or the reshare icons. So that's mm-hmm. one of the big things I think is a, it's a big temptation because you're like, well, I just want to be everywhere. And I just kind of let, you know, I'll just let the, let the automation happen. But the automation, you sort of lose that connectivity. So I think um, 
doing that and then not creating graphics or artwork specific for the platform because Canva is a great tool, canva.com. It gives you the actual dimensions for a Twitter post, for a LinkedIn post, for a Facebook post. So use that. You don't have to you know, work hard or reinvent the wheel. That's already been designed for you. And take the time to create graphics for that specific platform. And then in terms of things that you, you do want to do, sort of like the inverse of that, I really like taking the time, and we do this uh, for my show and we do it for our client shows. Like when you're on the specific platform, look up the tags of the people that you want to engage with. In, in our case, we have guests on our show. So I always make sure I know what their Twitter handle is, mm -hmm. what the, if they're on Instagram, if they have a Facebook profile, and especially on LinkedIn, because we work a lot with business clients. So what we make sure we do is when we post it, we take the time to um, speak about it in a way that's conversational. Um, and what a lot of people forget, for, for example, on LinkedIn is that, that you don't see the whole post. Mm -hmm. they, you see that read more. And so you have to be really conscious about what that headline is. All these mm -hmm. tips you learn about SEO, about making headlines, you know, engaging. We do that with our, the, the subject of our podcast episodes, um, which in turn become show notes, or, which are essentially blog posts. But also when we think about posting on social media, we're really conscious of like that first line. Like, what do we want? What, how are we going to grab people's attention and pull them in and have them click that read more, which then expands the post? So that's something we do on LinkedIn. And then we make sure we, we tag po uh, folks and always try to keep on top of like what the latest uh, trends are in terms of how to increase more engagement. For example, on LinkedIn, if you can get the amount of likes you can get on a post within the first 20 minutes is really critical in terms of figuring out, I mean, the first half hour in terms mm. of getting that engagement. So I think the magic number right now is about 20. So uh, if you can get, you know, your tribe, your fans and let them know what time you're posting, that's, that's helpful as well. And right now, from what I've heard about eight hashtags is like the proper number for a, a LinkedIn post for LinkedIn. For LinkedIn, yeah. And you never want to put the link in the actual body because there's the algorithm just like doesn't look favorably upon that. So oh, you wanna, okay. what you always want to do on LinkedIn is like, here's the episode we talked about. Use a graphic um, and say link is in the first comment. Mm. And so you would put that there. And even like people like to reshare articles, you know, their default is going to be to like put the link to the article in the main body. But what you want to do is just pull that out, get a graphic from the article, you know, whatever they used on the article itself, pull that same graphic on use it in the post and then say link to the article in the first comment. Oh, so, so you're so seeing, you're seeing like a suppression like Facebook started doing where they suppress exactly. things with links. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Is that something so that you've seen more like in the last six months or cause yes. I don't think that was okay. Yeah. I've seen it more in the last six months and the people that I'm, that I know in, in the LinkedIn community that actually have connections with folks who do this on a regular basis and do this for some high profile people like, through the grapevine, it sort of comes down and, and we, they share with us like latest practices, best tips. So that's where I'm, I'm hearing now like eight comments uh, that you and use them as well because it, people, it helps your post get more visible. Uh, mm -hmm. Put that comment in the first link and, and then just ask uh, an engaging, like have a way for people to connect with you and ask them to, to like the post, but also ask a question at the end of each post. So if I'm sharing an episode and it's about uh, productivity, the question would be, what's your most product? What's your number one productivity tip? Because right. sometimes you read posts and you're like, that was nice. And then you go on to the next one. Right. And, and it's just this, it's like a, it's, it's a slight, you know, difference in the way you post it. But if, if I'm reading it and someone's asking me a question and I know, and I have something to contribute, it's just human nature to say, oh, I have a cool tool I just used and you would put it in the comments. And yeah. so all these things really increase the engagement. And, you know, I'm sure it's the same on other platforms, but we're, we're really focused on LinkedIn right now where we're seeing this. Um, the more engagement you get, people liking, so people liking, people commenting on the likes, you go back in and you say, thanks for liking Stephanie and just kind of like get that sort of viral loop going for posts has, has been really important. And then, you know, obviously do the same thing um, on Facebook and on Twitter, you know, you just have to be more conscious because you've got that, those 240 characters. So just, mm -hmm. um, we actually, when we post on, because the life of a tweet, I think someone, I think I heard one time that it's like seven minutes, it's really short, it but we actually post every day for like for weekly episodes. So, mm -hmm. you know, Monday through Friday, there'll be a tweet going out every single day. And because Twitter is, you know, they don't like repetitive text now. Mm -hmm. um, what you can do is we, we, when we write show notes for guests, we, we pull out quotes, we pull out, we write about five, quotes from the episode. So we use those quotes in the body of, of the tweet. And that gives us, that allows us to refresh content. And then we create a static image for each episode, but we also create audiograms. And so audiograms, um, your listeners probably are familiar with it, but it's that animated waveform with the graphic and a snippet of audio. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. which in turn becomes a movie. And, and the beauty of those, why we like those so much, it, it's sort of like if you think about a Twitter feed, text only, right? People scrolling through that pretty quick. You know, uh, a post with a graphic, people look, okay, they're going to slow down a little bit. But a, a post with an animated graphic with some sound in it, then people are going to slow down. And then the next level would be an audiogram with the captions in it. Mm-hmm. Because people are like, sometimes they're in traffic. I mean, not in traffic. We don't want anyone looking at social media in traffic. I mean, uh, like on public transportation or, or, you know, or walking a dog or somewhere where they can't play like the sound out loud. But if the captions are there, it's going to slow them, slow them down a bit and allows them to engage with the post. But because it's Twitter, because it's so fast, you know, we definitely like to promote um, for the, you know, five to seven days that an episode goes, goes live. And then on the other platforms, what we do is once one post on LinkedIn, one post on Facebook, we're also repurposing um, the content a week later on medium Mm -hmm. mediums, a fantastic platform for promoting Mm -hmm. content because it was created by one of the founders of Twitter. It's Uh made for long form blog content. And there's people there that you can tag that, you know, really they've actually, a lot of people have moved their blogging platforms to to, to medium. So again, like, because we want, we never want to dictate where the conversation is happening. We want to be where people are having the conversations. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure we're active on all all the different platforms. But again, we want to make sure we're customizing the message we're we're posting on each of those platforms. Regarding audiograms, what do you think is a good length for an audiogram? Like a minute uh, or two minutes? Yeah, a a minute. I know audiogram is like letting you upload like over 10 minutes now or something. Yeah. like I use um, Headliner for ours and I think they're saying like you can upload a whole show. I'm like, I wouldn't yes. make an audiogram my whole show, would I? <laughs> like how long do you think it should be? No, 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 you wouldn't. Well, the guideline for me there is I go back and I look at what are the limits for a movie on or a video on Twitter and on Instagram. And I think it's 90 seconds. I think okay. it's 90 seconds or a minute or 90 seconds, so depending on the platform. So that's my guide for me because I wanted to play – in Twitter feed. I want it to play in the Instagram feed. Mm-hmm. I want people to be sharing it on their stories. So some, mm-hmm. some of our clients, they, they share the video, the audiogram in their feed, and some of them share it as a story because they have a, a look and feel for their Instagram. You know, some people like to get really fancy with like graph mm-hmm. grids. And so they they have a really clean feed. And so what they do is they share the audiogram in the, um, in the feed. And so in this, in their stories, and then you can create some of those, um, icons for like the way you, 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 sort of categorize your stories have you seen those right. so you can have one for your podcast and so mm-hmm. like all the all the stories related to your podcast you can put there um so that's something that we've seen is, is really interesting um again the beauty of an audiogram in a twitter feed and in, and in instagram is it allows people to get a sneak peek of the audio mm-hmm. and it, because it's a visual medium typically is created for uh, as a visual medium normally people would just see a graphic but because they can get get actually hear the audio and because you know podcasting is an audio a voice medium we want them as much as quick as possible to kind of hear a little sound bite um and that's the same sound bite we use to start the episodes it's, it's called a cold open but um if you make if you pick a good one people are, are intrigued and they lean in and, and, they, and they want to hear more so i have a question since we are of the same age i know you know the song by the bugaloos Video killed the radio yeah, star. I do. So did podcasting kill the video star? <laughs> well, here's the thing. Like 80% of podcasts are consumed on mobile devices. Like uh-huh. people are on the go. Like, and, yeah. and as much as people love um, video, um, you, there's some work involved in being in front of a screen, as, as I'm sure you're very well, well aware. And again, it speaks to how what people's tendencies are for how they want to uh, create content. Some people love writing. That's why they're bloggers. Some people can like whip up a Facebook live every single day or an Instagram live. I don't know how they do it, but like every day they're there, they're doing their like, you know, five minute uh, teaching on, on, yeah. and, and on, on LinkedIn is doing that as well. And I'm like, how do you do that? Like just the discipline, it takes so much work for me to think about video and I, I probably overthink it. But for me, I love talking. I love being behind the mic. Um, and so that's why podcasting is, is, you know, picking up a lot of steam. But that doesn't mean we can't leverage some of the platforms that have actually have video. Mm-hmm. And that's why the audios, the audiograms come in handy. But we actually do uh, post video, the episode on YouTube. Mm-hmm. We do it in a couple different formats. You can actually create an audiogram, which is the whole episode. So some of these are like an hour long. Yeah, that's and, what I've seen. Yeah, but to be honest, no one's really going to consume a lot of content on um, YouTube. But what's really important to remember is that YouTube is the number two search engine, right? So when people are searching, if you have detailed show notes and people are looking or or you have a high profile guest, you know, a lot of my 
if you uh, Google podcast junkies, I haven't done it recently, but a lot of my posts on the front page, I think I, I think I have all the po- all the links on Google for podcast junkies are mine. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, but a lot, a couple of them are YouTube. And it's because it's the way the search engine al- algorithm works that people are seeing it. And again, people find the show there and then they can have act. There's links in the YouTube description for them to subscribe to it. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing we've been trying out is actually taking those audiograms and going back and posting them on YouTube mm-hmm. and then creating a playlist. Mm. And what's, what's great about the, creating the playlist is that the way the YouTube algorithm works, um, I, and I have to probably confirm this, but it makes sense. The recommendation for the next video is going to be something I would think that would be in a playlist because YouTube would say, oh, this is yeah, something usually. that's in the playlist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you put all your audiograms in the playlist, the next one up, people will be like, oh, this is, this is a minute. Oh, I'll listen to this one. Oh, I'll listen to this one. And then they'll just binge to a couple that's of them. brilliant. So, I never yes. thought of that. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm going to write make, that one down. <laughs> make, that sure you're putting, make sure you're putting your videos in playlists because I, you know, the way the, uh, the it, it's just logical that the, the next recommendation would say, oh, it makes, if there, is there more in the playlist? Let's recommend that. Yeah. So I have a quick question then regarding blogs. Like you said, some people are really great bloggers. That's their medium and all this. And we've seen such a rise in audiobooks in the last, like going on almost 20 years now. Do you think there's any value in someone taking their blog and reading it, you know, as an audio and then putting that out as maybe even a podcast? Because, yeah. you know, I have seen many blogs where, I, you know, I'll read the first paragraph and I'm like, oh, I'll bookmark that. I'll go back and then I don't have time. So what do you think about that idea? Have you done that? I haven't done it, but I've heard some people do it. And you just have to be conscious of how it's going to be um, consumed and heard. And a lot of times, if it feels like you're reading, you know, it's, it's not going to have any energy. So um, we have a couple of clients that actually write out their podcast episodes. So in a way, they're writing it out. Um, and, and then uh, she's reading it. So this is a, it's called Photo Business Help. It's like 10-minute episodes she's doing it twice a week and she's teaching photographers how to build an online business, but she writes, she, she likes to write out the content first and then she reads it. Mm-hmm. So in the same way, it's, it's similar to what, like reading a blog post, but she's, she's writing it with the intent of reading it. Mm-hmm. So that's just something to keep in mind that if you are going to read it, you probably want to take a pass through it and make some notes so that you read it and it sounds natural. So don't just whip, whip up an old blog post, start reading it and think it's going <laughs> to, it's going to be compelling audio because it's probably not going to be, but I would do it. Um, try to keep it short. And if you're reading blog posts, you know, short content is really popular now. Like people are on the go. If they can have these like snippets of audio, these sound bites, you know, these podcasts under 10 minutes. Um, I think, um, one of this breaker is a, it's a podcast app and they have actually, actually have a category called podcast under 20 minutes or 10 minutes. So, mm-hmm which is great. So yeah, make it, make it short enough. Cause again, like I said, people are, are on the go. They're in, they're in, on their commute. They're in the treadmill. So if you get into their routine, podcasting is an extremely intimate medium. And that's why I'm like, I'm on this mic so close because if you think about it, like I step back here, like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a room and, and you can't hear me that well. But now that I'm in a podcast, like we consume these on audio devices. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, on earbuds. Right? right. And it's like, I'm, I'm talking into your ear. And if you think about like the DJ, like the nighttime DJ, like yeah. thank you. <laughs> and ASMR, which is like ASMR, a huge thing a... now. I mean, who would have thought yeah. that like six years ago was literally yeah. an industry now. Yeah. Um, but you're right. It's like somebody's right in your ear. You're having a conversation. I really love it. Uh, you gave us so many great tips. And again, what I really like about your business and what you've done, you know, just personally, is like you are very conversational and authentic in the way that you approach things. And that is something, you know, as a social media strategist that I'm always trying to teach my clients and my my students is that, you know, you have to be in the conversation. You can't just be on the content crank mill because for as much as you're throwing things out, if people aren't able to relate to you or, or feel like they can have some interaction with you, it, it's not really going to matter. Um, and I think that's a really good you know, something that I've seen you do really well with your business, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here. So I know you have a little special offer for my listeners. Um, So you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think part of the the challenge when people are getting started with podcasting is there's so much confusing information. So I put together something I call the ultimate podcast launch game plan. And it talks about the six pillars you need to launch a show. So if you go to fullcast.co forward slash Stephanie, with an F, of course. <laughs> you remembered. Uh, yeah. Um, 
and uh, you can get a, it's a free download. You can download it. It's, it's, it has all the things you need to start to think of. If you're thinking about starting a show, like what's it, much my number one hosting recommendation, microphone recommendation, you, you don't need to break the bank to get started, how you should think about where you're going to promote the show. Um, if you're doing remote interviews, my recommendation for that. So I've, I've, over the years, I've noticed people were asking me the same questions. So I've, I found that to be pretty helpful. So just go to fullcast.co forward slash Stephanie. Thank you so much. Uh, and that URL will also be in the show notes and on our blog page. Uh, so we will have links to Harry and his business and the free download and all of his socials. I highly recommend you follow him. He is a master at what he does. Uh, he is somebody that I admire, that I follow. And I, when you say to do something, I'm like, yes, that's what I should be doing. So thank you again for taking your time with me today. Is there, wait, there's something else? Yeah, I, I think oh. I just want to leave a, clo a closing remark because okay. I was just re reminded about that story. When I came back from Atlanta, uh, with the construction company. I went home. I had a ticket to Thailand because I had bought it. I went to visit a friend and we went there and I landed. It was like a 26 hour trip. It was amazing. We went on this. He went, he's like, I want to go show you this waterfall. We went up on this waterfall and he's like, you got to check the view from here. It's going to be awesome. And I was like, yeah, I want to go do that. And then I went to, on this outlook I, and I stepped into the stream and it was like the slipperiest rock you can imagine. I, la I went up in the air, I landed on my back and I proceeded to be carried over the edge of the falls. This happened, was happening within seconds, Stephanie, it was crazy. And it was a huge boulder on the left-hand side and I, I stuck my leg out and I was, able, I was able to stop myself. And I was like shaking, it was just like crazy. And then um, he was like wide-eyed. He was like, oh my God, this is like so wild. He pulled me up, you know, shaking the whole, the rest of the day, but I mean, eventually made, made a trip out of it, got back home to New York. And it's just like all this to say, like sometimes you don't realize this stuff until later. But I was like, man, what a shame it would have been if I had like died with my voice still inside me. Oh. And, and that's like my mission now. Like I'm, I'm on a mission to help them, like a million people find their voice and, you know, and Thankfully, podcasting has given me that platform. So that's like, uh, that's the, the message I want to leave your listeners with. Like, you should make it a point to decide, like, you know, after hearing this episode, that today's the day that you decide not to let your voice die inside of you. That is beautiful. You literally gave me goosebumps, which you can't see on the podcast, but if you see the video later on my YouTube channel, um, that, that's beautiful. And thank you again. You're amazing. And I appreciate your time. And you guys, download all the freebies that he is offering because it is gold. So thank you so much, Harry. Thanks again, Stephanie.